It's your feed. Hi there. Oh, great, the microphone's working. And hopefully all the slides work as well, so we'll see that. Um, yeah, so I have a, a lot of collaborators uh, at Facebook who um, worked on a few of the things I'm going to talk about. So uh, like some of the other speakers, I'm going to try and cover a few topics. So I'm going to try and cover some of the models we've worked on at Facebook and some of the tasks we've worked on as well. So uh, first, I just have this slide. Like, we want to make an intelligent learner. Like, what are the requirements for that? And you know, all of us can sort of try and write down a list. Uh, here, I've written down some. We'd like to have this learner to have a memory, to do reasoning, to work from relatively indirect supervision, uh, and uh, also to sort of learn the composition of functions, to be able to learn task transfer, to be data efficient, uh, because a lot of our models are actually quite data hungry, and to do, do things like planning. And there's lots of other things you could add to this list as well. Um, I'm going to focus on the first three. Um, so, yeah, so memory, so this is like memory networks and these kind of models. We'd like to be able to handle long and short term memory, to be able to use knowledge. And so this memory has to be very much linked to reasoning. So when we do reasoning, we can use this memory. And by reasoning, that could be, I could mean logical reasoning or maybe not, not so logical reasoning, like common sense reasoning or intuitive kind of reasoning, these kind of things we'd also like our models to do. And by indirect supervision, I mean a lot of uh, the work we do uh, in this field, we, we go and like label data, but that's not really how humans are learning. They work more from uh, understanding the world and actually rewards, maybe not so many rewards. So I call this indirect supervision. So uh, yeah, this is just a, a, a very simple sort of pseudocode of like what we're doing in like the research field. So uh, for, for people I'm working with, we picked this far off goal of an intelligent dialogue agent. And so how do we solve that? Well, we're still a long way, but we can do things like identify requirements, like some of the ones I've listed just now. And, and then we can try and choose tasks like data sets, for example, to evaluate these requirements. And if those data sets don't exist, those tasks don't exist, we have to go and build them. And then we can try and find and innovate models to solve those tasks. And those are the things we actually want, right? We're, as machine learning researchers, we're looking for those models. And you know, these, these uh, steps two, three, four, we can go and iterate around them and hope we, <laughs> hope we achieve our goals. So as I said, I'm going to focus on those three things, and I'm going to use the intelligent dialogue agent long-term goal to study that. So why, why dialogue? Um, I think it's a good setting because compared to, say, vision, you don't really need to deal with a perception problem. Like, you have words already which are very powerful. So that means you can access the reasoning problem kind of more directly because, you, you know, you, you, you can avoid the perception part. And there's clear uses of memory, for example, using past knowledge or conversation history, you can answer questions and, and these kind of things. And in terms of indirect supervision, um, it seems like a dialogue itself seems like a very powerful form of indirect supervision because every time your learner uh, sp speaks, says something, and gets a response back, uh, that response back, you can think of it as a sort of the state of the world at time t plus one is like, you know, the thing that's said back to it. That can be a kind of supervision by predicting what the person is going to say back. And that is a kind of powerful indirect supervision. So we're going to, we're going to use that, and I'll show that in uh, the forthcoming slides. So models that we've worked on in my group, or some of them, are listed here. So we've worked on this class of models that we call memory networks, and there's, there's sort of variations of it that we've developed. Uh, there's an end-to-end -end memory network, a key value memory network this year, um, a forward prediction memory network, which can use this indirect supervision by predicting the future, say the future dialogue. And also, just very recently, something we call a recurrent entity network <coughs> as well. I've also put some related models down there, but there are many more. Um, so 
what is a memory network? Uh, if you don't know, um, <laughs> well, I just have a picture. I'm not going to put the equations. Uh, so it uh, consists, the input consists of a set of memories. So this is M1 to MN. And they could be, say, sentences from a conversation history. I mean, you could use this for vision as well. And they could be like frames of video or, or whatever you want. But uh, typically, we've been looking at it in terms of dialogue. Uh, and then uh, a query queue is coming in. So for example, in a question answering setting, that would be a question. But in a general dialogue setting, that could be, say, the last dialogue utterance of the person that it's speaking to. And then these memory uh, items that come in, they could be like uh, the past conversation history plus all the knowledge that it has. Uh, for example, some uh, like all of Wikipedia or something like this. It could be that if you want, uh, as long as the model can scale to that. So then the first thing that, that happens is that you have some kind of um, sentence or text encoder that will convert those memories and the input, uh, the query queue into vectors. So you could use an RNN encoder for that. You could use something much simpler, like a bag of um, word embeddings or whatever you want. And then what's going to happen is there's a controller module that uh, compares the query to each of the memories. And this is called an addressing stage. And it will score them. And that could be as simple as, say, a dot product between the vectors. And then there's a reading stage that comes back and gives back the result to the controller. And that could be something like returning the best MI out of the set that you compared to Q. So uh, that could either be a hard or a soft decision. Uh, and then once you get, you read back, say, those relevant memories, that's what you, this process is meant to do, you can uh, add that to the state of the controller and repeat the process. And this idea of sort of recurrently repeating the process is going to be important for um, making it able to do some kind of a little bit more complex reasoning. Uh, so that's kind of the class of models. And then the, the first version that we um, developed, it had a very simple setup where uh, we weren't actually doing backpropagation through the whole model. We had like supervision at every stage of the memory addressing. We actually gave uh, labels of which memories it should be selecting, and we had a hard attention scheme. Um, but we showed that could work if you had that supervision. But you obviously want to relax that. We want to try and make the supervision as indirect as possible. So. The next model we had is called the end-to-end -end memory network. And so the way we did that is we instead used a soft attention. Um, and then we could have gradients and backprop through the network. And we only need uh, a super supervision signal, basically, at the output here. So this is still for like supervised learning tasks. Um, and that. We showed that working on a few tasks, which I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show in a minute. Um, so that, that was last year. Now this year, uh, we just made a very simple extension called the key value memory network, where um, instead of these memories, MI, just being kind of these just single vectors, we split them into key value pairs. So now you have two vectors for each memory representing the key and the value. Um, these memories, uh, you get to choose them. Like you, uh, that's kind of, you can either look at it as a pro or con of the of the model that you get to choose like what you want to put as M1, M2, M3. You can either put them as the conversation history, as you know, items in Wikipedia, whatever you want. So you actually get a little bit more control in this key value memory network because now you get to also choose what is the key and what is the value for each of these memories, and. If you can choose that well, we showed that that, that can help. Because basically what's happening is in the addressing stage, you want to uh, use the key and compare that to the query. And then in the read stage, where you send back information to the controller, you use the value. So if the key matches the query and the value matches more the output, which are two very different things, you're going to have much more, in, you know, much more relevant matches there. So that's kind of a, you know, I haven't given any examples of a very sort of general idea, but that 
that can be useful. Um, so the other, another thing we've done uh, also this year, which is uh, actually a paper at NIPS here, which I presented yesterday in the poster session, is um, the forward prediction memory network. So this, this part <laughs> the, of the figure without these two blocks at the top is basically the model I, I already showed you. But that was used for supervised learning. So um, what we want to do here is instead of having labels, we want to try and predict the future state at time t plus 1 and, and hence be doing unsupervised learning. So we treat now the output as, a, as an action, if you like. And um, then this last layers that we've bolted onto the network, what they're going to do is um, predict the the new state, which in dialogue is going to be, say, the, the reply of the person that the learner is speaking to, uh, conditional on the original memories, the query, and the action that it actually took. So, uh, yeah, this ends up as a, also a very useful idea uh, for dialogue, which I'm going to show. Finally, one more model <laughs> that we've uh, worked on. Um, so this is an iClear submission. Um, we're trying to get rid of this idea that you kind of have to choose what these memories M1 to Mn are. So even though that could be useful to be able to encode that prior knowledge, you might want your model to actually be able to learn to read and write to its memories. I mean, like actually the neural Turing machine or DC, DCN. DNC, DNC, DNC. <laughs> no, that one just doesn't roll off the tongue for me. But um, yeah, all the DNC do. So this kind of makes actually a step more towards those kinds of models. Um, so basically, what we're going to have is this new um, memory module here, which uh, every time we get a new input, so like these um, sentences here. Uh, of this story, and then there's a question at the end, uh, it's going to kind of ingest each sentence, and that gets fed to each memory cell, and each memory cell is a separate RNN with uh, key value uh, components, and those RNNs, each one, depending on its key, otherwise they share the same weights, decides whether to kind of use and store this new input, and we learn the weights of those RNNs backpropping through this whole model, uh, such that at the end, after ingesting all the uh, inputs, where you get to the point where you want to uh, predict an output, what you're going to do is feed in those uh, memory cells, their current values, exactly the point of a normal memory network here, instead of kind of just uh, choosing that. Uh, yourself, and then apply the normal memory network. So uh, we just kind of bolted on this bit to the memory network, if you like. You can look at it that way. Although, actually, this part here is relatively complicated. And then we can train this whole model. And um, kind of our motivation here was that we would like to, um, as well, yeah, assume these memories are not given, learn how to read and write to this memory, and kind of track the state of the world. So if you think of these sentences here, of this story kind of being uh, the state of the world, we want our memories to kind of track, say, uh, where, um, where Bob is, where the football is. So hopefully some of these memories are kind of doing that and updating themselves as the football, say, is moving around or Bob is moving around. You want those values to be changing. And that's something the normal memory network is, is not doing. So, yeah, I've kind of said that bit. That's actually the equations of the model, which I'm not going to get into. But it's actually not, well, it's not super, super complicated. Um, so those are all the models. And, uh, but as I was saying right at the beginning, um, if we want to kind of you know, find what, this intelligent learner, we want to innovate models, but we want to evaluate them. Uh, and that might mean that we need to like, find tasks that evaluate certain skills, these certain requirements and sub-goals that we're looking for. And so these are some of the tasks that we've um, develops uh, uh, a fair that test various things. So first, there's the 20 baby tasks, which um, 
perhaps many of you know, that tests 20 different uh, skills, reasoning skills, with very simple simulated um, toy data. Uh, so they test kind of reasoning and very limited memory. Um, then we developed something called the children's book test, which is uh, a bit larger and, and more real data. Something called the movie dialogue data set, which then moves on from um, uh, question answering into actually more full dialogue. Uh, and then this year we've also made another six um, baby tasks that are actually more geared towards dialogue rather than question answering. And then finally we have another data set called the dialogue based language learning data set which uh, tests this ability of, of doing a forward prediction model which we couldn't do with say a question answering data set because we need, we need dialogue like responses of a teacher. So I'm just going to go through those. Um, so first, the baby tasks. So um, I kind of already showed a little bit of that with the entity network. Uh, we have these 20 tasks, and they consist of stories like this. John dropped the milk. John took the milk there. Sandra went back to the bathroom. John moved to the hallway. Mary went back to the bedroom. Where is the milk? And to answer this, you need to do reasoning over these uh, sentences of the story and actually, this is called a two supporting facts task. You need to actually first find that John has the milk. So, and, and here in these columns, I'm showing the attention weights of an end-to-end -end memory network. So in the first two uh, hops of addressing and, and reading of the memory, it's kind of putting all the weight on that sentence. It finds that. And now that it has that, it can update the controller state and uh, try and find now where John is, now that it knows he has the milk. So it can answer this question, where is the milk? So that's why now it has the attention weight on, on this sentence until finally it can get that right. So this is the kind of thing that I call, I mean, it's a kind of reasoning, it's a little bit smarter reasoning than just, say, selecting one sentence, right? So, um, I mean, kind of one of my goals is being able to see this happening actually in real data, not just toy data. So uh, as one thing I'm always looking for is uh, if we increase these number of hops in a network, do, does the performance improve? And you can see that that's happening on, on these uh, baby tasks for an end-to-end -end memory network. Um, but, you know, I want to see that happening on real data as well. So... Um, End-to-end -end memory network on a thousand training example uh, per task, it's uh, f still failing on 11 of the tasks. So where failing means it gets less than 95% uh, accuracy. Um, so the baby tasks have actually been evaluated in two flavors, typically either 1,000 training examples per task or 10,000 training examples per task. And um, in the 10,000 example regime, uh, the results are obviously better. Uh, you have things like the DNC and dynamic memory net that are um, failing only one or two tasks, and the recurrent entity network that I just showed you, that was my last slide um, of models, which is also learning the memories, that's uh, managing to succeed on all the tasks at the 10,000 example level. So this is a good result. But if you go back to the 1,000 training set uh, setting, that model actually uh, is still failing on 15 of the tasks. Um, and the end-to-end -end memory, as I said, still fails on 11. And I'm not sure I know the results for neuron training machine or DNC, but uh, both of these models and the entity network are all quite complex models. So, um, you know, because they're complex, they can overfit, right? And it's, you know, uh, that could be um, why they might, not, they might not do well in this setting. So I would say there's still a bit of life in this data set yet because you know, we're interested in data efficiency, which is one of the requirements I put on the first slide. So we really want to look for models that both succeed on all these tasks and uh, can do it with as few examples as possible. And, and then, of course, work on real data as well. But, you know, this is just one test. So, um, yeah, so then we, we made some real data, this children's book um, data. Instead, uh, so this is 118 uh, real children's books from Project Gutenberg and set up... Uh, how much time do I have left, actually? Oh, oh none. <laughs> none, is that right? 
None. Okay. Yeah. So we have this data set, and uh, and then let me just go quickly to this one. And uh, we made uh, dialogue data sets as well uh, that try and test how good you are at predicting the next uh, thing to say on Reddit, as well as doing question answering. And um, yeah. Less people have used this data set compared to the baby task and the children's book test. So I think that's an interesting way to go to actually solve dialogue. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, you were so fast. Uh, now we have time for questions. Are there any questions? Oh. <laughs> I thought I had none. I thought I had no time. <laughs> Yes. For video prediction, where you use the context to provide the supervision signal. Yeah, so there's. Uh, there's but, I, a, but the question is that in dialogue setup, how is that actually set up? Is the, a term become the context, mm. or is it. You know, sentence. You know, one term. Big, big um, yeah. So it actually is shown on this slide. Oh, okay. Um, that so you would have s something like this where you have a story. Uh, there's a question, and now the answer of the learner is an action, and then you get back a response okay. from the person speaking to say like, if you get this question wrong, they could say no, that's incorrect. So I look at that. That is the action. The thing they're saying. The state okay. oh, it was the original question plus all the context before. And now the new state uh, includes the answer. So you, the forward prediction tries to predict that new state. Okay, so state. that no, that's incorrect, become the supervision signal yes. in back propagation. So if okay. you can predict that someone's going to say, no, that's incorrect, or yes, that's right, and they're telling the truth uh, to whatever you say, then you're a long way to understanding whether you're right or wrong. Oh, that's a very, very noisy signal. Um, that's the way I see it. Well, if they're telling the truth it's, and they say that, it's, um, it's pretty much the same as receiving a reward. But uh, you can actually get much more than a reward from this kind of signal because the teacher might say, no, the answer is kitchen, and actually give you the answer. And that has way more than you could ever get from a numerical reward, right? Because the reward there would actually be zero because you got it wrong. No, the answer is kitchen. But you actually know the answer. So this is actually what the forward prediction model does, which is uh, very, turns out to be very useful. That's great. Thank you.